You're listening to a CNA podcast. Welcome back to the Climate Conversations. I'm your host, Julie Yu. It's a familiar sight for many people flying into Singapore, a waterfront skyline dotted with skyscrapers overlooking Marina Bay Sands, five star hotels, and the Singapore Flyer. But many of these prized properties sit on reclaimed land or land that's at risk of flooding if sea levels rise. And what does rising sea levels have to do with anything? Well, experts say a lot. Even a one meter rise can result in serious flooding. In response, the Singapore government made a splash last year with the announcement of the Long Island Plan, a reclamation project that, as its working name suggests, is a massive undertaking. Spanning an area almost 1,150 football fields and stretching three times the length of the current East Coast waterfront, this groundbreaking project is expected to unfold over decades, kicking off with technical studies this year. To navigate the excitement, challenges, and uncertainties of this journey, we are joined by Dr. Stefan Chua, Research Assistant Professor of the Earth Observatory of Singapore at NTU. Dr. Chua, thank you very much for joining us on The Climate Conversations. Thanks for having me. Firstly, just how imminent is the threat of rising sea levels in Singapore? I think it is an existential threat. Mm -hmm. We are so low-lying. 30% of Singapore is actually less than 5 meters above mean sea level. Mm -hmm. Now, to the casual listener, it sounds like a lot. 5 meters is taller than most of us. We think that's a lot of buffer. Mm -hmm. But we also know that based on expert projections, sea level may reach up to one meter. Mm -hmm. That's our guiding principle for engineering purposes here in Singapore. Under certain high-end scenarios, that means things that we are uncertain of in terms of our projections in the future, it may exceed one meter. And it is important to know that it's not just sea level that poses a flood risk. It will be compounded by high tides, by storm surges, even by rainfall. So if some of this come together in a so-called black swan event, mm -hmm. low likelihood, high damage scenario, it can pass five meters. Hence, we are very vulnerable. I just want to touch on that projection that Singapore could see a one meter sea level rise by the year 2100. And when people hear 2100, that's what, 76 years from now, it feels like a distant future. So why is it crucial to start the coastal protection fight early? That's a great question. So it's like with climate, we see it as an existential threat that's slow in the making. Um, scientists and the scientific community has come to a consensus that although we can do little to change from now to 2030, what we do today changes the trajectory from 2030. Mm. In other words, it kind of skews the gradient so climate change is not set in stone, which is why we have the Paris Agreement. And that in turn have a great bearing on the amount of sea level rise. If you look at the literature and you look at the expert reports out there, the IPCC has different scenarios mm -hmm. based on business as usual, based on worst case, best case scenarios. You can have as large as a 0 0.8 centimeter difference in sea level change by 2100. Mm. So what we do today has great bearing as to how much it really changes. So that's one thing. And second thing is the assumption that sea level rise will be linear or what I've called consistent. So if we can predict sea level rise, we can deal with it. Mm -hmm. So if we can say, oh, it's going to be 2 millimeters per year and by in 100 years, it'll be 20 centimeters, we can deal with it. So these are things that is so wise and prudent for our government to actually deal with this now and manage some of these risks and uncertainties going forward. So could you just share with us some key initiatives or strategies that Singapore has undertaken so far to mitigate the impact of rising sea levels and how effective have they been so far? Singapore has always taken a technological engineering approach and it has done us well. Mm -hmm countries with huge swaths of land. Mm -hmm. They can afford to have this thing called a buffer zone where they allow the coast to be dynamic and they don't have any developments within a few hundred meters from the coastline 
we can't afford that. Right. So Singapore has a large array of seawalls, maybe about 70% of the southern coast has seawalls all the way to Tuas. I think that holds the coast in place. Mm -hmm. So in terms of effectiveness of holding back the sea, very effective. There are trade-offs, meaning you lose your natural coastline. So in front of those coasts, you do not have your sandy beaches, you do not have your mud flats and so on. Yeah. Another way that Singapore tries to manage is reclamation. But it has been around for since the time of Raffles. Mm -hmm. So the first reclamation was as long as 1822. Mm -hmm. When Raffles came, he wanted to set up a thriving port. He reclaimed the land. He filled in the swamp land. He excavated to create a bustling port in Boat Key, Collier Key, and so on. In the 1930s, reclamation for Kalang Airport. Mm -hmm. So again, it's for an economic interest. It may have some changes to our river systems, but indeed it brought great economic and industrial benefits. Mm. East Coast Park. So in the 1960s, it was already reclaimed. It helped us create the ECP. There's a whole lot of amenities, including one of my favourite hawker centres <laughs> uh, along East Coast Park. So that residential strip, multi-purpose, multifunctional recreational space. These are all good. And it helped to reclaim the land from the sea and create an extra buffer. Finally, to the north coast, seems to be places that we prioritize nature-based solutions. Right. So there'll be mangroves, mud flats. These are natural buffers mm. against sea level because mangroves can accumulate sediment and keep up with sea level. Mm. Hence, very coast-specific strategies, which in my mind looks very comprehensive. Mm. I wonder why is Long Island necessary for Singapore and how will it work? Long Island is necessary for our sustained thriving and growth. I think Singapore needs to protect itself from rising sea levels and coastal retreat is our fear. So again, a zero-sum game. When sea levels rise, when the land is flat, the sea can encroach further in, which is what's happening in the East Coast. Right. Very flat, very low-lying. Any increase in sea level would lead to large coastal erosion, coastal flooding, coastal retreat. And so it's imperative that we protect that coastline. Mm. In 2019, PM Lee alluded to the Long Island Project and said that if we create these islands, we have a freshwater reservoir, it will make PUB very happy. And mm. I think that kind of sums up the Singapore strategy. Mm. We want to hit many birds with one stone and it's so brilliant that they can protect the sea, mm. protect against coastal erosion and waves, create a waterfront, create 800 hectares of land, mm. all for growth and for protecting that place without losing it. Mm. So another strategy that was mooted was to put a long seawall with 12 tidal pumps across the entire East Coast Park right now, but that would entail losing our beach. So Long Island is a massive project that's going to take decades, right? Yes. Are there any potential risk or downside for this Long Island strategy? Yes, there are always trade-offs, cost-benefit aside. Mm. I think there will be changes. So one thing that we earth scientists love is nature. Mm. So we believe the natural coast is the most beautiful coast because it exists in a very beautiful equilibrium with the physics of nature. So when you build an island further from shore, you are changing the wave dynamics, the tidal dynamics, the sediment dynamics totally. And it may not just be impacting that area, there can be downstream effects. For example, sediments. Mm -hmm. Sediments can also be a zero-sum game. You lose sediments here, it must go somewhere. You gain sediments here, somewhere else must lose. Mm. So if there are sedimentation differences, our southern islands could potentially either be over-sedimented oh. or starved of sediments. Some of my colleagues who study coral biology are concerned that reclamation and changes to some of the sediment dynamics may cause a siltation on our coral reefs and lead to more smoldering, less light reaching our corals. Mm. Finally, I think changing the shape of the shore, so a kind of gentle gradient, helps dissipate wave better. Mm -hmm. Waves just refract more easily. But when it's straight, basically a sheer wall or cliff, your wave refraction and reflection would be direct, scouring any of the underlying sediments, and it may lead to increased turbidity and so on. So there are things that 
this five-year study, I believe, must consider. But most of all, beyond modeling, I think it's imperative that we study the actual sedimentation and uh, physical parameters there. Mm. So is there a way to design this with nature in mind? We are trying a few forms. Again, colleagues who deal with corals, I understand, are looking at putting some form of structures on the sea walls or on the foreshore of these long islands to have places where you can grow corals. We do not really understand the salinity differences. So one thing that comes to mind is that you're going to change the salinity of East Coast Park totally. Mm -hmm. It will no longer be a marine environment where you go in, you drink in some water, oh, it's salt water. <laughs> now, if it's a freshwater reservoir, you may not be even allowed to jump in, actually. Mm. So if it's freshwater, your ecosystem there will be totally different. That means you can no longer sustain, say, mangroves. Mm -hmm. Organisms that are used to a saltwater condition may face stress. Seems like the striking the balance between coastal protection and marine life protection. I mean, it seems a lot of factors to be considered here, yes. uh, Doctor. So when we look at past mega reclamation projects, like, for example, Marina Barrage, it's one of my favorite places to go. But I mean, it stands not just as a flood control system. It's a landmark where, you know, millions of visitors go and enjoy themselves. They contribute to Singapore's water resources as well. What sort of lessons can we learn from these successful projects, if I can call it that, you know, considering its multifunctional role? That was a great move. Basically, it is a dam and a pump. Right? It's a giant dam and pumps that can manage the flow of water in and out of the barrage. I believe it was maybe it's PUB or whatever government agency managing it. It's astute enough to realize that you have buy-in mm. when you create multifunctional places, aesthetically pleasing, that can serve both protection and aesthetic and recreational function. So I think with this train of thought going forward, I have confidence that Long Island, if it is going to be called Long Island in the future, will fulfill the same function people will take to it. Residences right now in the current East Coast are concerned with noise, property value, but I believe that it will not diminish it because this gives an extra resource for amenities to be developed, for park and recreation to be developed. And Right now, if you go to East Coast, actually, it is in danger of foreshore erosion. Mm. There's a lot of this scarps and cliff that's being eroded by... Oh, so we're already seeing signs. We're already seeing signs. You will see some places where they chain it up, do not enter because it's dangerous. Mm. It's slumping. So this multi-decade Long Island project may alleviate some of these problems. It's still very early on. Of course, we are expecting technical studies to go forward this year. I mean, what sort of specific assessments and consideration will be pivotal for the success of this Long Island project? We need to take both an engineering approach, understand the physics, understand the viability of putting such structures there, understand the forces that it has to take, whether it's wave, wind, currents, we also need to take an environmental impact assessment approach and nature lovers as well as naturalists and experts will probably characterize the type of ecosystem there. What probably needs to happen more is because of the scale. It's huge. Mm -hmm. And so when you have such a huge change, there'll be huge upstream downstream changes. As I was alluding to, it will change the hydrology, it will change your hydrodynamics, your wave, your current direction, which is already quite dynamic because of our monsoon system, mm -hmm. because of El Nino La Nina cycles that actually change sea levels in an order of centimeters. So I would say we need a long-term study on the physical characteristics of the water, the sediments, where it comes from, where it goes to, and then model how a structure like that would change and divert some of the forces and the directions, the drivers, so to speak, mm. of sea level change and sedimentation and so on. You've been in this field for a long time. So what does your gut feeling tell you? Is this feasible? I believe that Singapore will make it work. We have the resources. We are blessed with the resources, the know-how, to solve a myriad of problems that come from it. What we are worried about is the unknown unknowns. 
it's difficult to predict everything in nature, which is why even in our projections, whether it's NASA, IPCC, there is uncertainty. Mm. So these uncertainties, we try to mitigate these risks by studying as much as we can. So my concerns as a sedimentologist is potentially where the sediments will go and whether we will staff certain areas, whether the diversion of sediments will lead to unwanted depot centers in our Singapore Strait, especially in uh, ecologically sensitive areas. So now with greater impetus to get stakeholders involved and academia and industry involved, I think we have a more comprehensive approach right now. So I'm fairly confident that this will be a success. Okay. And doctor, should this project prove successful, do you think it'll help other countries in the region facing similar challenges to start you know, planning for their own versions of Long Island? The jury is still out because, for example, it takes decades, a decade or so for even the unconsolidated sediments to settle. Oh. So that already takes a decade. So we are talking about 2040, 2050. Mm. So by then, it will be a very different world. Mm. We can use this as a case study to encourage the rest of the world to perhaps follow suit. But by then, there could be new technologies, there could be new ways. And as mentioned, this is a very country-specific solution, so to speak. Mm. So we are land-staffed, water-staffed, highly dense population-wise. So if another city faces similar conditions and faces similar challenges, by all means. But it is a hefty price and it's only because we have the resources and the know-how to do it. But yes, I'm beyond polders, which we tried for Tekong, which Netherlands seems to be the guru, so to speak, that consults. Maybe Singapore in decades to come can be the guru of creating barrier lagoons. Mm. But the jury is still out because it's so far away. Okay, well, thank you very much for coming in and for this insightful conversation. Here's hoping that the Long Island project will be a better shaped by public feedback and the aspirations of people like yourselves in Singapore and ultimately help the country to overcome challenges posed by climate change. Thank you very much for your time again. Thank you very much. Many thanks to Dr. Chua and to our listeners. We hope you enjoy this episode. The team behind this podcast is Tiffany Young, Sai Nguyen, Joanne Chan, and Crispina Robert. Till we meet again next week, I'm Julie Yu.